Hello, everybody. We'll be getting started in about one minute here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this is Sparking Innovation in the Business Sector and Fostering Change in a Changing World, Use of the En-ROADS Climate Simulation Model in the Business Sector. Uh, my name is Chris Page. I am partnering with Climate Interactive to introduce this fabulous tool to the business sector. Um, previously, I was at Amazon and Yahoo uh, running sustainability and climate change, and before that, Rocky Mountain Institute. So I'm going to be drawing a little bit from my own experiences over the course of this presentation. One of the things I want to say at the outset is we're going to be doing a very brief introduction to the model. We're going to be spending about 10 minutes on the En-ROADS model, showing you what it is for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, and giving a refresher for those of you who are. What we're going to be spending the majority of this time doing is talking how businesses might use it to foster conversations, engage, communicate urgency around climate change within the business sector. And then I want to leave a lot of time to hear from our fabulous partners at HSBC, PepsiCo, and Cargill about their own experiences using the En-ROADS climate simulator in their businesses. And of course, leave lots of time uh, for Q&A at the end, because I'm hoping we have lots of conversations uh, that are sparked from this. Um, just a housekeeping thing. If you look at your control panel down at chat, feel free to open that up. We have co-founder of Climate Interactive, Drew Jones, uh, and Caroline Reed, who are available to answer questions specifically, particularly if you have questions about the model, feel free to just go ahead and uh, send a message to the entire audience so we can have an ongoing dialogue. I think that'll help to keep this uh, interactive and dynamic. And both of them are a wealth of knowledge about some of the details there. Um, so again, on your GoToWebinar control panel, there's a tab called chat. If you just open that up, then you can follow the string along as we're talking. And also questions, Chris. There's the questions one for yep. specific questions. Yep. Oh yes, questions for questions. That's Drew Jones. Hi, Drew. Hey. <laughs> and we're here to help you. We've got the chat window. If you're interested in running a virtual workshop after you hear a bit more about the model and what we're up to, uh, feel free to contact us. We're going to be offering live sessions around the workshop uh, this Thursday and beyond. There's going to be more and more opportunities for online engagement. So look at the Climate Interactive site or look at some of the links we'll be sending you uh, later on in this presentation if you're interested in that. So very briefly, En-ROADS model. Uh, this is a partnership project between the nonprofit Climate Interactive and MIT. Uh, it's an incredibly robust model. Underneath the hood of this dashboard, you've got 30 years of climate science, 15,000 different equations running incredibly quickly. What this is is a tool for engagement. Uh, it's a model whereby you can look at the impact of 18 different policies and sliders and measures that you can take uh, that are here on the lower part of the screen uh, to answer the question, how do we fight climate change? Under current assumptions, we're looking at a 4.1 degree increase, Celsius increase by 2100 which scientists agree will lead to catastrophic changes uh, in the environment. And we want to avoid that. And under the terms of the uh, Paris Agreement, we're shooting for a target of 2.0 degrees Celsius increase by 2100, or even 1.5. So a question that we ask, and we can ask using this model in real time, you can engage people and get them to think about is how do you get to 2.0 or 1.5 degrees? What are the different factors that you can deploy that are the best leverage points for getting us there, for creating effective change that we need for bending that curve? And of course, I need to point out the obvious, which is we need tools like this more now than ever. There's been seismic changes to society and the economy over the last couple of weeks, over the last couple of months. And it's incredibly hard to capture people's passion and commitment to fight climate change, particularly in the business setting. You're, you're going for mind share. 
and it's even harder to do this virtually than remotely. The good news is this is an incredibly powerful tool for doing this. This is a tool that has the ability to engage people's passion, urgency, get them to interact and problem solve in collaboration with one another, even if you're on the other side of the world for them, sitting at your computer in your own home. So this is a tool that is coming at exactly the right time, given the challenges that we've got. This is a great way to foster interactivity. A big part of sustainability within business, in my experience, is about the elevator pitches and the hallway conversations and the networking events and the conferences that we all attend together. In the absence of that, tools like this are gonna be filling the space in virtual and remote tools like En-ROADS. And this is a great one. We want to put this at your disposal so you can use it for that purpose. Um, so you have this model. How do you use it? You're not just sending people a link and saying, hey, play with this model and it'll give you great insights in climate change. There are a bunch of different formats that you can use and they're very flexible. A very common one that we've used repeatedly is the, the climate workshop. And the idea here is you engage people and ask them the question that I asked uh, when we we're looking at the dashboard. How do you get to two degrees or 1.5 degrees? What are our, your assumptions, your audience's assumptions about how you do that? Which levers are going to get you where you need to go? And you can have a facilitated conversation with people where they express their opinions, they make suggestions, and you play out what those look like in real time. Another way that we found this very successful 140 people at MIT uh, ran this very recently, is a simulation game or role play. Uh, the Climate Interactive team put together a virtual event last Thursday that was incredibly successful. People from multiple countries, multiple time zones, playing roles. You broke out into groups where some people represent the oil industry, some people represent ag, some people represent renewable energy industry, some people represent developing countries, and they all get together and they negotiate about what levers you're going to pull in order to get below two degrees. Um, there's also an individual exercise that's available online at climateinteractive.org. You can play with the model, it can um, help you to query the model yourself if you wanna try it yourself or offer it up to students as an exercise. Uh, we've also seen a pitch competition where people break into teams and see who can come up with the most compelling scenario. And of course, there are probably ways that we haven't thought of yet. And we encourage you to offer suggestions. How do we use this model uh, effectively in an engaging way to engage your business partners? And we've already seen really great response to use of this model. Uh, it was formally launched in December Madrid at the Climate Talks. Um, and I had the good fortune in February with Alan Green, with Andrew Greenspan and Paul Stanley of HSBC to present it at GreenBiz Conference in Phoenix, Arizona. And out of 111 sessions over three days, this is an incredibly compelling dynamic event with amazing speakers, Andrew's workshop. Uh, was the highest ranked by attendees. People found it incredibly compelling. And here are a couple of testimonials uh, from the panelists to we'll be hearing from later about the impact of the model uh, on themselves and on the audiences that they work with. So with all that as a, a preview, I'm gonna take a very brief tour through the model itself. And I'm gonna pause for a second to see if there are any questions. Great. So when we ask audiences, particularly business audiences, what do you think it's going to take to get us to two degrees or 1.5 degrees? What's it going to take to avoid uh, a, a future that none of us want? Uh, there are a couple of common themes or a couple of suggestions and answers that come up repeatedly when you're dealing with a sustainable business audience. One of them is definitely new technology. As a group, we're very inspired and optimistic about the power of innovation and invention. So the notion of a new technology, of a clean, low cost, zero carbon source of energy that's not currently available, being created in a lab today and having a huge impact, that's a very powerful mental model a lot of people have. That's something like 
uh, nuclear thorium fission, nuclear fusion. Not available today, but if there's a breakthrough, uh, that it's going to be a game changer. Um, and when you ask people about the impact, sometimes they say, we think it's going to have half a degree or a degree worth of impact on that 4.13 Celsius increase up in the upper right hand corner of the model. Here. Um, just orienting you to the dashboard for a second here. Again, we've got over the left hand side, got energy supply, a bunch of levers that you can move around coal, oil, natural gas. In the middle here, we've got demand for energy from transportation, buildings and industry, and then just population and economic growth. And over on the right here, uh, we've got some levers around things like deforestation and afforestation, planting trees, and also methane from industry and agriculture. And over here, we also have technological carbon removal as a slider and a lever that you can move. Up here in the left-hand corner, we've got global sources of primary energy divided by source. We've got a bunch of different lines here. Under current scenario, our assumption that's about what's going to happen over the next 80 years, you see how the different sources of primary energy are behaving over time. So if you go to new technology and you hit that button, oh, my screen's frozen. That's interesting. Hang on a second. Bear with me, everybody. Yep, that's in fact frozen. Hang on a second. Do we have any questions while I'm getting this geared up? There. Okay. There we go. Chris, let me do a, oh, there it goes. I got it. Um, so let's assume we've got a breakthrough in new technology. Uh, somebody discovers nuclear thorium fission, gets it working in the lab. What's the impact? And what you see is you went from 4.1 degrees down to 3.9 degrees when you have that breakthrough. It's not actually as big a change as people think it might be. Um, so what's going on there? Um, and I think the thing to realize is there are delays in the system. Just because something exists in the lab, um, it takes time to commercialize. It takes time to develop it. Um, it takes time to get it and grow it so that it's a significant part of the electricity grid over time. So you see that orange line moving up into the right, but it's really not starting to have an impact until 2040 or so. Even if you go to, uh, you know, an even bigger breakthrough, you're not necessarily seeing impact as great as what you might expect. Um, so even if you go to huge breakthroughs, um, you're not necessarily seeing enormous changes over time. Um, another thing to look at, and you can hit the replay last change button here, take a look what happens to your other lines. You're seeing an increase in new tech over time, new tech energy, and you're seeing that decreases the use of coal, use of natural gas. It also creates a little bit of a decrease in renewable energy. If you have a clean, cheap source of energy, it's going to compete with uh, renewable energy. So the impact of renewable energy growth is less in that model because the two sources are competing with one another. Another nifty thing that you've got in the model, if you go up to your miniature graphs, you can look at a bunch of different factors uh, all at once. You look up here, the, under cost of energy, that black line is current assumptions, current scenarios, also known as business as usual. That blue line is the scenario we're running right now, assuming a huge breakthrough in new technology, that cost of energy. So cheaper energy is available. Look over at energy demand in the bottom left, you see an increase in energy demand. When you have cheap available energy, then people tend to consume more. There's a rebound effect. Speaking as someone, I worked a lot with our data center engineers when I was at Yahoo. And when you have power at two cents a kilowatt hour in data centers in Eastern Washington, it's hard to sell investing in energy efficiency. It's hard to resist the temptation to consume more energy when it's cheap. So there's an unintended consequence there about having that cheap 
clean energy available. So that's new technology. That's one of the leverage points. Another one that people talk about a lot in the context of business is electrification of the transportation fleet, the Teslas, the hybrids, electric uh, airplanes. And again, the assumption is that's going to have an enormous impact. If you look at that, incentivizing that, um, and doubling down on it, again, you're not seeing a huge impact, even if you crank that way up. Uh, you're not actually seeing a huge impact. And again, what you're seeing here is, take a look when we run that in a second time, that red line's going down, oil is going down, but you're seeing all other forms of electricity, not just renewable energy, but coal and natural gas increasing. In the absence of other levers, in the absence of other mechanisms making your grid cleaner, you're actually going to be consuming more fossil fuel in the electrical grid if you electrify your fleet. So there's an unintended consequence. You can draw people's uh, attention to that particular insight to do that. That's electrification of the transportation fleet. And a third one that's super common to hear people talk about is planting trees. There are lots of fantastic initiatives around planting trees in the business community. Um, and there's a very similar dynamic in terms of the delay effect here. You start to see the impact kicking in in the middle of the century. Um, there's a delay. Trees take time to plant. Uh, and you see that increase over time. You see it even more if you get high growth. But again, it's not really kicking in until you've acquired the land and trees have had time to plant, to be planted and to grow. Um, so you're starting to see below that line, uh, land use CO2 going down and carbon being absorbed in the atmosphere. But in terms of really influencing increase in temperature by 2100, there's a big delay in the system there. Now, none of that is intended to make people feel discouraged. It communicates a sense of urgency and points out none of these solutions by themselves are silver bullets. Even all three of these together aren't a silver bullet in terms of getting us all the way there. They're important. Planting trees has a very important uh, implications in terms of social justice and biological benefits if it's done right. And there's no silver bullet. There's only silver buckshot. When you're talking through this with people and figuring out how, in fact, we get to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees, you can point to some other examples um, that are out there. Um, and this is, you know, there are some really good examples of leverage points that people are starting to pay attention to. Microsoft made a commitment to uh, looking at technological carbon removal. They've committed to reducing their total historic carbon footprint dating back to 1975. So what happens if a bunch of companies and investors and policymakers follow suit and get very serious about technological carbon removal, technologies that are currently available, can have high growth. That has a tremendous impact. That can reduce a lot. Excuse me, yeah. Chris? Yeah. Can you hear me, Chris? This is Drew. Yes, what's up? Yeah, so I'm getting a bunch of really good questions in the question box. So uh, I think we've answered maybe 30 or 40 already. It's fantastic. So please keep asking the questions. We'll try to get to them. Um, two of them that I thought you should know about, one of them was, uh, Darcy Winslow, our dear friend, is asking, mm -hmm. will we get ever in this plan to 1.5 or 2 degrees? Mm -hmm. So I think people are looking for a little hope and possibility at some point. That's yep. just a push from Darcy to you. Yep. And the second one was really about changing assumptions in the model. Rebecca mm -hmm. Krask, or Kraske said, can we change assumptions for afforestation? That delete, delay seems huge, she wrote. So mm -hmm. um, that's yep. her question. I thought maybe others would be interested in that one. So I didn't just write an answer. I, I thought I'd bring it up to you. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, that's a really great segue. Um, let's pause for a second and talk about assumptions in the model. That's um, You can go in. One of the things, you can stick at a surface level and move the sliders around. Under each of these, you can look at your assumption and change what your assumptions are. Time to secure land for afforestation is assumptions based on a lot of peer-reviewed literature around forestry. 
you want to change that, time to secure land for afforestation. Let's change it from 10 years down to four years. You want to change the planting time, change that down to 11 years, and see the impact. It does have a bit of an impact, not a huge impact. Uh, but again, if people are questioning the assumptions, you can go into pretty much each of these parameters and uh, look at the assumptions and change them. That's a good one over time. Um, in each of these different categories, there's it's an incredibly robust model in terms of, all right, if you don't agree with the assumptions here, let's have a deeper conversation about it. The other thing to recognize about um, the impact of forestry or removals of land use um, is land available for carbon dioxide removal. That's a big part of the afforestation discussion is how much land globally is available. Um, again, peer-reviewed literature suggests it's around 800 hectares, and you can max that out. But for context, this dotted line here, that's the area of India. Um, so in terms of land available for afforestation, that's a big constraint on this, not just delays in the system over time, but the amount of land that's actually available for carbon dioxide removal. Um, so it's great to have that part of the conversation. Again, planting trees is an incredibly important, important part of the solution. It has a lot of other benefits to it. By itself, it's not gonna be a silver bullet. Um, Darcy, I'm glad you asked that question. Like, how do you actually get there? Um, like I said, there are a bunch of different things that you can do. You're looking for the silver buckshot instead of the silver bullet. And this is part of the conversation you can have with an audience in real time is having them brainstorm about the different measures that you need to take and the impact that they have. So like I said, Microsoft's getting very serious about carbon removal. What if globally a bunch of companies, investors, uh, policymakers get serious about carbon removal? If you look at other examples, um, the Bezos Climate Fund, Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, has announced Bezos Climate Fund. We don't know specifically what he's planning on focusing uh, with the, on with that. But let's say for the sake of argument that they start going after methane reduction in industrial and agricultural use, uh, which is a typically overlooked sector in many respects. That can have a huge impact if you figure out about reducing methane from industry and from agriculture that can have a profound impact. Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock Investing, announced in January via a letter to investors, signaled the intent of BlackRock to move away from investment in coal. What if investors, policymakers, and companies continue to send that signal and the result is globally we stop investing in new coal infrastructure? You've got coal over here. You can look at taxing coal, but if you go a little bit deeper into the model and slide down here, you have an option to stop building new coal infrastructure. That has enormous impact. You get about half a degree from that. Energy efficiency, reducing costs from energy, buildings and industry, transportation, that has enormous impact. That's just good business sense. And then if you put a carbon price around medium here, you're getting below that two degrees mark. This isn't intended to be prescriptive. This isn't Chris Page's recipe for getting to 2.0. The intent is to have a conversation with the folks that you're engaging with, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's an audience of hundreds, whether you're doing it in three and a half hours, or if you've only got half an hour or 10 minutes, as Drew did uh, at Climate Week last year. Um, the intent is to take people on a learning journey, engage with them, help them understand the urgency of the problem, fact that there are multiple uh, solutions that are needed as soon as possible in order to get the job done. I'm um, understanding how all these factors interact with each other over time. I'm going to pause and see if there are other questions at this point. So many people are writing great things here. Um, nothing specific that I think everyone needs to know about. So uh, people are getting them handled one by one as Caroline and, and I write here. I think I guess generally a lot of uh, things are found on the website. So um, when in doubt, go there and we're sending people to the proper pages. But uh, keep rolling, Chris, it's sounding great. Yeah, and just to reiterate, you know, the intent isn't to say this is the solution and how you 
this is how you get here. The intent is to get people to think about this, engage and inquire in a way that really isn't possible with a PowerPoint presentation or uh, just a conversation. The intent is to get your fingers in there, get people engaged using this model so you can co-create solutions and look at what kind of a future you wanna to build together. And again, back to our current state right now, we're seeing tremendous disruptions in the economy, in industry, globally. So questions about looking to the future and saying, what kind of a world do we wanna to build together? What kind of a world do we need to have that's gonna be resilient in the future? This is a great tool for starting to ask those questions of one another. What are the biggest impacts that we can have? Where do we need to be investing in order to prevent the next global crisis? Post COVID-19, post this pandemic, what are we rebuilding and rebooting? How do we want to go about doing that? What's the world we want to co-create with one another? So I want to leave some time for the panelists that we have lined up uh, to talk about their own experience because I've certainly learned a tremendous amount from them uh, as well, just in our conversations, getting a chance to co-facilitate with Andrew uh, at GreenBiz. I do wanna talk briefly about how might your company specifically use Enro? How are you using this within your company as a formal member of a sustainability team, as the head executive in charge of sustainability, um, or as an entrepreneur within a company who isn't specifically affiliated with the sustainability team? A um, Couple of options. An obvious one is when you're just getting started. When you look at companies like uh, Mozilla, Akamai, uh, Dropbox, all those started great sustainability programs with people who were incredibly passionate about this and had day jobs and were moonlighting and built out sustainability practice for their company. Just as a couple of examples, I'm sure you can think of some others. This is an incredibly fast and compelling way to start engaging people, get the attention of executives, engage your colleagues, make a case and also figure out your company's place in this world. Where are the leverage points that you can have the most influence on that make a difference in terms of climate? So in terms of getting started, either before you enter into uh, doing a carbon disclosure project report or enter into a lengthy and expensive benchmarking study, this can be a great tool to start asking questions about what you wanna build within your company. Um, around a sustainability strategy. It's also incredibly useful for taking things up to 30,000 foot level. If you have a robust and existing sustainability strategy, sustainability goals and sustainability team. My, from experience at Amazon, Amazon has now well over hundred people working on sustainability within the company. And it's incredibly easy in that kind of environment your head's down, you're focused on the day-to-day -day execution against established goals and commitments. Sometimes it's hard to lift your head up, convene together, and have really robust conversations about uh, the future, a 30,000-foot conversation, taking a step back. Um, this is a great tool for that. It's a great tool for bringing people together and having those conversations, getting passionate and knowledgeable individuals together to talk about what if, to talk about the future together to examine existing goals and look towards the future. I also want to say a few words about channeling, channeling the passion of your leadership. Um, this is a really interesting one because um, you're looking at folks like uh, some of the folks on the screen here. Increasingly, you're seeing individuals who are incredibly passionate um, about individual topics around sustainability. We've got Larry Fink, Elon Musk, uh, lower left-hand corner is Mark Benioff from Salesforce, Jeff Bezos, uh, Richard Branson from Virgin. Folks like this, they tend to be incredibly uh, knowledgeable, passionate, driven, um, occasionally opinionated. And while they consult with their sustainability teams, consult with experts, in formulating ideas, um, it's also very common that you get commitments, uh, deadlines, 
goals, tweets, investor letters, and then after the fact, uh, the details and the nuances of execution um, are filled in after the fact. What this tool does a lot more effectively than a PowerPoint presentation is an opportunity to engage folks and get them to go on their own learning journey, them and uh, key decision makers, executives who report to them. Um, this can be a really effective tool for that. There's at least one example of a former CEO up here in the Pacific Northwest whose opinion about the impact of new technology was influenced because somebody who was a key part of their team uh, saw an early version of En-ROADS and realized that, wow, new technology is important, but it isn't a savior, it isn't that silver bullet. So for the executive audience, for your busy leadership and decision makers who have a personal passion, this is a great way to engage um, and query some of uh, their assumptions in terms of leverage points. Um, it's a great tool for that. And then these next three down the bottom, breaking down silos and challenging mental models within your company. If anybody has ever had the experience of um, trying within a sustainability team to convince people that climate change, sustainability is everyone's problem, not just the purview of the, the sustainability team, uh, something like this can be a lot more effective than a PowerPoint presentation or just having an argument trying to argue for your priority. Um, whether it's reaching out to your investor relations team, business units that are focused on operations and growth, uh, your, the government relations folks who are engaged in the day-to-day -day in Washington, D.C. and are concerned about partisan politics, it can be a very powerful tool for talking about the mental models and breaking down those silos and having conversations. Um, engaging employees company-wide on climate, again, uh, something like the the game, the role-playing game can be very effective uh, for large audiences without a whole lot of familiarity with climate change who are passionate about the issue. We want to have more engaged and knowledgeable about this subject. And then last but not least, get engaging clients, suppliers, and customers. This is, I want to leave this a little bit more to, uh, to Andrew and Roberta particularly to talk about, but beyond your company, can you use this as a tool for talking to clients, suppliers, and customers about climate change and what you might collaborate on and build together in the future? Um, so I'm going to pause again for questions, just to check in, and then I want to hand it over to Andrew Greenspan um, from HSBC. Uh, the one question I'm uh, getting that might be uh, relevant for later, uh, someone really asked about uh, uh, Cargill and about the possibilities for agroforestry. So maybe um, that would be something that could come up when, when Tarek is taking the floor. Right, but, uh, yeah. That's about it. Okay. So Tarek, you're, you're on deck. Uh, um, we'll queue up that conversation. Andrew? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, absolutely thrilled Chris invited me to share with you all HSBC's journey with Climate Interactive. It's uh, a journey that's really, really taken off. I um, actually asked Chris to include my email address here because I really would love to hear from anybody that you know wants to understand more about our experience with En-ROADS, how we've used it uh, beyond the little overview I'm able to, to give here. So please do, please do email me. Uh, so about two years ago, we invited uh, Climate Interactive to facilitate an En-ROADS workshop with employees. And as we delivered the session almost live in the moment, we had two two really striking realizations. The first was that you know this was the most effective tool we'd ever come across for what we like to think of improving employees' ability to to speak climate, right? To understand the climate system and the effect of of the different mitigation actions. It's really the only training experience I've ever seen where all employees' eyes were were locked forward. You know, nobody reached to the BlackBerry. And this, the second was that there's such connectivity between the bank's own sustainability strategy and the solutions uh, that can be modeled in En-ROADS, as we just saw with Chris's demo. Um, we really took this second point and ran with it. Uh, we've designed our own HSBC workshop using the tool. And essentially the way it works, just briefly, is that after some basic grounding in climate science, we get right into the model. Um, we explore the ways in which 
the bank's own sustainability commitments, whether it's in our commitment to buy renewable energy, to restrict the financing of coal, uh, on the positive side, to financing the transition to low carbon of these, uh, these carbon intensive sectors, these could all be modeled in En-ROADS by simply asking the question, you know, what if the rest of the world followed our lead? And so the way it plays out in the workshop is we model a couple of the ideas from the group um, together. We discuss the outcomes together, and then we give them the model. Um, we give them the, the model to explore different solutions in small groups using their own laptops, and then they share their reactions, right? What surprised them? What did they struggle with? Uh, in their small group? How do they now feel about the bank's commitments? How do they now feel about the ability to achieve two degrees? And that that debrief, that discussion, uh, really, really packs a lot of power. And employees leave with that better understanding the of the climate issue and the urgency of it. Uh, but perhaps more importantly for us at the bank, this understanding of how integral HSBC is as a major global financial institution in, in driving all of these uh, much needed solutions. And so since the, those early moments where we designed our own workshops, we've taken it to asset managers, we've taken it to senior risk folks, commercial bankers, we've even taken it on the road uh, to our counterpart, corporate sustainability functions elsewhere in the HSBC group. I've trained up my counterparts in Paris, in Dusseldorf, in Dubai, uh, to be able to facilitate these workshops uh, for their employees as well. And each time we've tweaked the structure, I'm, I'm sure you're getting the sense from Chris, En-ROADS allows you to be quite versatile. Um, our sessions have worked with, with really any audience of any size. Um, we've done everything from 30 minute lunch and learns to two hour sessions, you know, intimate sessions with members of senior management. I was even lucky enough to, uh, to co-facilitate a session with the World Energy Congress in Abu Dhabi with a fellow En-ROADS ambassador from Romania. And, uh, you know, to highlight the personal effect that's had, you know, connecting with these other truly passionate people from around the world, uh, that's been extremely rewarding for me since I, since I started this work. So you know, in, in closing, I'm excited to turn it over to Roberta. Uh, it's, been, it's been a blast helping Climate Interactive you know, expand this, this take up of En-ROADS in the corporate world. Um, we had this incredible success at GreenBiz that Chris mentioned being the top, uh, top rated event out of 111. And I think, you know, I feel as an indication of how excited people truly are about this and the tool's potential, I'm going to hand it off to somebody that was actually in the audience at our GreenBiz session, who was so inspired uh, by, by what Chris and I delivered that she's already taken all the facilitation webinars and even in, invited us to do a session with, uh, with some of her senior managers earlier this month, which made for, you know, an excellent business-to-business uh, -business collaboration. So. Roberta, I hope I didn't steal any of your thunder there, but of course, I'm very excited to hand it to you and have you share with the group uh, your experience as well. Thanks, Andrew. Yep, and no, no, no problem. I was going to reference that now, what now will be famous Green Biz session, and just um, iterate to the uh, reiterate to the to the group here that it really you'll see a quote from me in one of the slides. It really did set my brain on fire. Um, it made um, attending the conference uh, worthwhile uh, just in and of itself. So in the two months since that conference, as, as uh, Andrew said, I've gone, I've burned through all of the training webinars that um, Climate Interactive has on their website, which are excellent, by the way. Um, and I have um, gathered together a team of folks from the sustainability community at PepsiCo to do the same so that we can establish kind of a cadre of uh, workshop facilitators and deploy them uh, around the business. Um, PepsiCo is the second largest food and beverage company in the world. We have over 250,000 employees all around the globe. Um, so my, I'm really jazzed to um, bring En-ROADS to as many of them as uh, is physically possible. Like Andrew, I'm also really keen to um, help uh, the Climate Interactive team spread the word um, elsewhere. So uh, I don't have my, my email address on here, but I'll put it in the, in the quote box after I'm done speaking so that you can reach out to me if, if you want to. What I wanted to talk about is the two ways that I'm going to use um, En-ROADS in, in PepsiCo. First is awareness. 
uh, I mentioned the 250,000 PepsiCo employees uh, were going to run workshops starting with our senior leadership team. And by senior leadership team, I mean the CEO and his direct reports and then their direct reports all around the globe. Um, there's about 80 people that run PepsiCo um, at the highest levels um, and we're I have permission to um, organize a facilitated workshop for them in, in chunks, um, COVID-19 response um, permitting, of course. So first and foremost, uh, uh, build awareness on what is required by the world to address the cr climate crisis and also create a sense of urgency um, that really we have no time to wait because one of the great things that the module the model does is shows us the impact of delayed action. Um, I want to inspire some of those employees to become En-ROADS champions themselves and take it not just to their teams but to the outside world, um, to their friends and family. Um, the second thing that I'm using En-ROADS for is to provide a reality check on PepsiCo's climate action strategy. One, one of the things that as part of my remit in PepsiCo is to develop our climate action strategy and then deploy it across the business, which we're well engaged in doing. Um, what I loved about the um, this incredibly user-friendly, interactive, single-page dash dashboard that you get with En-ROADS is uh, it allowed me to see at a glance where PepsiCo is currently leaning in on um, several of the 18 levers needed to drive change uh, and also where we aren't but could be. And I'll give you a couple of very specific examples. Um, first, energy efficiency and um, electrification, we're doing that. You know, we have robust energy efficiency programs in place in our plants. We're spending a lot of capital dollars on driving um, energy efficiency to reduce um, scope one and two emissions. We're also um, move, have moved into uh, electrification of our uh, fleet for distributing products. So that's a check. Um, one of the things that hit me in the face when I was playing around with the module or the model is, as Chris pointed out, what happens if we stop building new coal power plants? Huge impact um, and really important. So it made me think, okay, PepsiCo got out of coal several years ago. We no longer use coal in our in our own operations, but I've never asked our tier one suppliers if they're out of coal. So what that piece of the model added to my climate strategy is an effort to lean in on that specific topic as well as others with our um, supplier base to encourage them to get out of coal if they're not already. Um, last example on you know, how this really um, is factoring into PepsiCo's um, climate action strategy is carbon pricing. So we were um, out there already advocating for a price on carbon, particularly in the United States. Um, what the model does is in a very um, a credible way um, with some great credentials built into the model um, in a very credi credible way shows how incredibly effective a price on carbon would be. Um, for this journey. So when my managers asked me, Roberta, you know, how do you know that advocating for a price on carbon is really the a good thing to do? You know, how what kind of an impact could it have? Suddenly in the En-ROADS model, I have a way to answer that in a very user-friendly and visual way. So, um, you know, I, I owe a big debt of gratitude to, to Andrew and Chris for um, holding that Green Bez, um session and a big thank you to Andrew for, for coming in and helping me introduce it to my boss and a few others within PepsiCo and um, the sky's the limit for me with, with, with En-ROADS and we're going to make the most use of it as possible in PepsiCo. Roberta, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tarek um, ask Tarek to make a few comments. Tarek's an interesting position because he's a, a perfect example of somebody within a company who's 
not a formal member of the established sustainability team taking this model and using it to influence uh, leadership within the company. So, Tarek? Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, exactly like Chris said, uh, I am not working in the sustainability department. I'm actually working in the commercial department of, of Cargill. I encountered En-ROADS at MIT and uh, had the chance that uh, Professor Sturman and Jay and Andrew uh, trained me on the, on the beta uh, version. And then they let me uh, run with it in, inside of Cargill. And I really started at the very bottom talking to very small groups. Up in, within six months, I managed to present it to half of the leadership team, including the CEO and different uh, business unit leaders. So what, what I want to stress with that is that you don't need to have a sustainability background to go and do something in your in your company. You you can you can do it uh, without that. Uh, how the model was valuable for for Cargill. So um, since my approach was was a bit more unstructured, but what the first thing I, I managed to achieve is uh, within the leadership team to increase the awareness and understanding of the broader uh, climate change dynamics and their interconnections. So the famous 30,000 feet view. And you would be surprised at how many uh, people know about climate change, but there is always pockets that they don't know. So you fill in the blanks and, and people are very thankful for that, especially at the at the top of the house. Um, and <clears throat> when you do that, what you also manage, what we also manage to do is to, to push the boundaries of sustainability. So what I mean by that is that the people look at sustainability not as a, something to do on top of the other things, but rather to include it in the in the business, to look at it in terms of risks and, and opportunities around the, the the climate change dynamics so really to mesh it into the the business strategy and the first um, things we saw in, in Cargill is that people started to ask me into uh, meetings to show En-ROADS in order to support or to accelerate the the approval of nascent and existing initiatives around alternative energies, cleaner shipping, or uh, even CO2 trading. And uh, the, also the, the other good thing we noticed is that uh, some, some decision makers said, okay, let's, let's take En-ROADS and use it with our partners of, uh, for example, when, when you are dealing in, in scope three. So, uh, so that's, uh, how about my experience in, in Cargill with the with the model um, concerning the question around agroforestry uh, for the time being Cargill doesn't have a plan as such to plant trees and or to manage forests uh, in order to sink carbon but uh, we have commitments strong commitments on deforestation in um, the the Amazon and other ecosystems in in uh, in South America, as well as in Indonesia around palm. So South America is more soy, and and Indonesia is more more uh, more palm. So and again, what I want to stress is, please take the classes and en roads, and even if you're not from the sustainability department. Just go ahead, start to talk to the first person and then the next, and you will see, you will get traction. Maybe get allies that have projects going on or that they want or who want to propose projects. That will be a, a quick accelerator for you to get more and more traction in the, in the company. That would be one of my advices. Voila. Voila. Thank you so much. Um, so in terms of next steps, reach out to 
the climate interactive team, reach out to me, uh, reach out to our panelists. Uh, to get involved with NRO, sign up for an online version of the workshop being run this Thursday. Instead of 10 minutes, uh, there's interactive, uh, much more extended example of, of the workshop being run in three different time zones this Thursday. So a chance to really try it out and see what the experience is like. We have an ambassador program. Um, it's a unique opportunity to use, we've got seven hour long webinars online get trained up on using this model so you can take it into your communities, your populations, your companies, uh, and use it. Um, make sure to follow uh, Climate Interactive on Twitter and either email me if you have questions, interested in a facilitated discussion. Um, Andrew, Roberta, Tarek are happy to answer questions about their experiences within the companies. Um, and if you have technical questions about the model or anything else you want to know, um, support at climateinteractive.org. Um, before we open it up for q and A, I I do want to talk about something. Uh, there's a climate scientist in upstate New York who talks about this because something that can be very overwhelming is like I still don't understand how we fit into this. How can my company influence all these different levers that are necessary? To get us below two degrees like we're just a single company we're you know we're in the widget making business you don't have to do all of it in terms of taking this and taking the insights from this model uh and taking action inspiring people to action um now's the time to play the save the world symphony uh, it's not about knowing the entire symphony it's about knowing what instrument you hold and playing it the best you can picking it up and playing it um, you don't have to play a solo. We're all in this together. The intent of this model is to communicate the urgency and help people figure out what instrument they and their company and their organization and their communities want to pick up and play. I'd like to open it up for Q&A at this point. So Chris, I'm seeing um, lots of specific questions, but um, I guess I invite everybody to write into the question box and Chris, do you want people to write their question there or raise their hand and then you call on them? How would you like to proceed? Good question. Um, why don't we raise the hand? Let's do that. Uh -huh. So I see Andrew Mangan. Do you, do you want me to just, want me to be your uh, director for a minute and then you can answer the question? Yeah. Uh, okay, I unmuted Andrew, and uh, I think you have the floor. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. It's a wonderful tool. I can see it's so so easy to use, and uh, uh, understanding the assumptions and other elements is something I'll be planning to do, at, but it's uh, very powerful. We're working in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico coastal region with a bunch of companies, including uh, a lot of the big emitters of uh, carbon who are dri driven to try to are, are, are increasingly interested in decarbonization so i'm going to be using this with that uh, we call it the gulf coast carbon collaborative but uh, i wanted to I, I i got most of my questions were answered as you went through uh would look forward to engaging with you in the future but have you had, uh, I, I love the case studies, if you have any of those that you can share in addition to the panelists, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and those particularly about oil companies? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, probably, uh, well, it's not just oil, oil and gas, the LNG, the, the chemical industry, yeah. uh, all, uh, and manufacturers as well, I mean, so I admit we're, we're anything you want to add, Chris. I know I have a story about oil and gas when when you're done. By all means, go for it. Yeah, so we've done um, some high level briefings and workshops with several oil and gas companies, particularly the more progressive ones. Um, we had an engagement several years ago with Total in France, so we worked with their executive team and also with Equinor back when they were Stott Oil in Oslo, working with an executive team there. And um, the thing you say, if you wanna have an engagement like that, is research shows that showing people research doesn't work. They all know that, 
You can't just read the reports. What those Total and Equinor found was that they could have a just a better conversation when people were disagreeing about climate, when they're able to change assumptions, change scenarios, um, and um, really just talk better with a, a grounded tool helping them play out various scenarios. So it works, go do it. I see Victor raising his hand. Victor? Yes, hello. Thank you. This is Victor Yosha here talking from Brussels, Belgium. I very much appreciate this discussion around uh, how business can make use of this uh, software. Um, through an EU-funded opportunity, we have built a team of En-ROADS facilitators around the EU um, in countries like Luxembourg, Belgium, Netherlands, UK, Hungary, and we came up with this as an opportunity for companies, businesses to educate and entertain their employees um, on climate and energy. So basically as, as an educative team building exercise. And, um, and I would be happy to hear how other companies might, uh, might take this as an opportunity for a team building exercise. We know that a lot of companies have so many different uh, choices to choose from what kind of team building exercise should we bring to our employees and this is this is one that's educative and entertaining as well so i'd be happy to hear is there anyone else who is into this uh, around the world thanks great idea okay uh, if, if I might just say, uh, Victor, I, I think it's a great idea, and I think that the uh, the game um, climate action actually, because of its length uh, and because it involves teams, negotiation, and uh, they they put you in situation, would be a a great a great tool for uh, for this. Otherwise, as entertainment. We, what we did as Cargill, we used it also for lunch and learns, but that's a much uh, lower style type of entertainment. It's only one hour, but people actually loved it. And nobody looked at their phone, which is a very important metric nowadays. Yeah, Tarek, it's Andrew. Maybe I'll just add to your comment and also, Victor, I think this relates to what you're asking. We saw incredible value in these workshops we've created. Uh, for, for team building, particularly that interactive uh, version of it where employees can, can get up and um, sort of negotiate their position table to table. Um, so we have placed this in senior management offsites, um, even lower level employee offsites. And related to that, we've figured out how to embed this in our broader sustainability training curriculum. So it's not just taking advantage of sort of the ad hoc requests to do these, and of course we always welcome those, but embedding it in the in the company's training curriculum, I think R Roberta was touching on this a little bit. To me, that's, uh, that's the true measure of success internally if we've taken this phenomenal tool and embedded it in the, in the training curriculum that already exists and is already scaled globally to employees. So just wanted to add that. Thanks. Um, just speaking to, uh, this Zoom role-playing that Climate Interactive facilitated on Thursday, uh, not being able to meet face-to-face -face doesn't necessarily need to be a barrier, um, especially if you're dealing with doing employee training across a multinational company. Um, the Zoom training involves breakout groups. You could actually put people into roles and then the individual negotiating pods could have their own breakout groups on zoom and then really seamlessly return to the main group for the next round of negotiations it was amazing how something that uh, the climate interactive team put together very quickly was super interactive we had people from multiple time zones participating and that ability to go into your breakout groups play your role figure out the point of negotiation then come back to the larger group um, it was actually very compelling in terms of use of virtual technology to run a fairly seamless 
role playing kind of game with the En-ROADS tool could be incredibly useful, especially when you've got uh, employees scattered all over the place to having something that engages a bunch of folks in different locations. So highly recommend that. Seeing anything else online, Drew, in terms of questions and comments? Uh, Rebe Rebecca just asked if we have a recording of the Zoom session that we could share. And um, many of the recordings of these sessions are online. And so, yes, we can share many of them. So, uh, but no other general ones. Uh, no. Okay. Um, just a couple of thoughts uh, that I have in terms of some of my own insights from this. Um, some of the challenges you can run into, which I think using the model can help to address and surmount is fear making existing commitment here less attractive. You know, like we just made this huge commitment to planting trees. You know, what do you mean it doesn't have a huge impact? I think using this to think about how those particular actions uh, behave over time. I think both Roberta and uh, Andrew talked about this a little bit, can be incredibly compelling. And you shouldn't shy away from saying, okay, we need to understand better how existing previous commitments uh, interact with other future uh, commitments. Reluctance to engage on policy and politics is a common thing. Again, if you're engaging with your government affairs team, this can be a really effective way of doing much, much more so than just trying to have a same old argument with them about why they should prioritize this. Um, and again, this being the global problem, what can my one company do about this? Figuring out which instrument you and your company want to, to play um, and where you fit into the larger picture is a really important part of things. Um, so those are some of the challenges and the objections that I've heard, and I think the model actually the experience of the model addresses them quite well. Um, the other thing, I think Andrew and I have both noticed this in comment in this, Roberta and Tarek, I don't know if you experienced this, is um, that you can and absolutely should leave on a hopeful note when you're presenting this. You really need to stick the landing. And there are a variety of different ways to do that. You know, relying on personal anecdotes, pointing out that this is possible, although it's not necessarily easy. One thing that we've used um, is pointing out how rapidly important changes happen and how exponentially they happen. There's sort of a tipping point in terms of doing this. Um, and, uh, you know, everything from uh, um, interracial marriage to uh, Roe v. Wade to same sex marriage things seem impossible until all of a sudden they don't. There's this incredibly compelling graphic from Bloomberg. I've heard people use uh, individual um, anecdotes. So ending on a hopeful note in a way that resonates with your community and your culture is incredibly important. I don't know whether any of my panelists want to talk more about that, like how you end on a hopeful note. Mommy? I think you should include children's voices in the webinar. That tends to bring up spirits all over. So that's just. Uh, <laughs> My version we all, of the, uh, we all want to think about the future. <laughs> uh, I think the key thing uh, is to shift over and 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 just do it. Like right now, so I'm I'm really mindful of having watched. This is Drew. I've I've just watched dozens and dozens of people go through this process of getting to the place where Andrew and Roberta and Tarek and Chris are now. And uh, this process of witnessing someone doing it, you see a webinar like this, then you invite Chris or one of these folks to come and just do a lunch and learn over the go to meeting or over Zoom. And then you get to learn with them and then build your own capacity and get trained. So I think I'd, the main hopeful thing is a call to action where you actually do something such depressing times if you're not doing something to make things better in the world. So invite Chris or someone on our team or a partner to come run one of these sessions online. And maybe she's about to say that, but uh, go do something, get on the track to being a facilitator who can engage other people online with these tools. Any last thoughts from our panelists?
Uh, sure. Just real quick, it's Andrew. I'll take the chance to to plug the um, the advanced facilitation techniques webinar. Um, I think when you Aww. get in when you get in the groove of starting to do these, um, you know, to me, the sort of the next level of proficiency is, you know, you, you know the not, you know the model. You're comfortable with the climate science. You're comfortable with the the strategy piece. It's how do you handle the difficult questions? You know, is is an extended silence okay? Um, how to land positively, how to stick the landing is part of that. Um, I think that's an excellent resource because, you know, true success comes with practice with facilitating this, frankly. Um, but Climate Interactive, you know, Drew and team have put together some, some really great resources through those webinars about how to, how to be more comfortable, how to, how to be more uh, able to handle some of the challenging questions because people get into this. You know, your audience will, will participate. And so, um, you know, that's some of the, the really enriching discussion that comes. Um, so best to take advantage of those resources and be prepared for it. But yeah, go, go out and do it, as Drew says. Great. I'm thoughts? putting a, a link to those webinars in the chat right now. And many of the other links uh, that people have asked about are be put, have been put in chat as well. Um, Any other closing thoughts from Tarek, Roberta, the Climate Interactive team? Take Excellent. the facilitation class. Yeah. Yeah, get back on track. OK. Terrific. Well, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your time. Feel free to reach out to us. And uh, thanks for taking time in your schedules to, to meet with us and hear about the model. Chris, are you open to sticking around to answering more of these questions that didn't get canceled, answered in the question box? Because people might have them. Absolutely. Maybe after you formally close, you could stick around because I see questions yeah. that are coming. Terrific. I can absolutely do that. Okay. Well, uh, I yeah. so I'd say I'm looking at the question box here, and um, if you want to stick around, I think it's formally over, but if you have any more questions for Chris, uh, feel free to ask them, and we'll read them out to her, and she can answer to you. So if you have other ones that we didn't get to, maybe uh, Caroline and I didn't, we were typing most of the time, but uh, there are others, uh, please write them in here, and uh, or Chris can turn on your mic if you raise your hand, if you want to ask them. Yep. And I am, I am not seeing anything in the chat box or anything like that. So can you, if there are any, can you read some of those off to me? I sure will. Um, let's see if any, if anybody comes in. So uh, we'll just give people a minute. They might be typing or getting the feeling to raise their hand if they want to um in the in the attendee box also happy to run any additional simulations if anybody's interested. oh <laughs> that's even more fun yep if you if you disagree or want to query any, I've got a couple of my favorites, so. <laughs> uh, it sounds like we have a request for something similar. Um, we have a question saying, could you walk through the carbon price advanced info, the starting price up to X year and final carbon prices, et cetera? So maybe just diving oh, into gosh. those advanced options. Fantastic, yeah. So down here in the lower left-hand corner, you've got your carbon price. And status quo is, is zero carbon price. You can go to high, to very high, and all the way up to very, very high. And if you want to take a look at what that means, um, you can click on uh, the carrot and go down and look at a whole variety of different assumptions in here. Uh, very high. What does very high mean? 249 bucks a ton. Um, is very high. If you want to set it at medium, which we were doing in, in the scenario that I was running, that's 22 bucks a ton. And then you've got a bunch of options in terms of what's the year the carbon price starts to phase in. You can vary that and say, let's start it right away 
let's move it out to 2032. And then there's the years to achieve initial carbon price. You're starting it at 22 bucks a ton, it kicks in, and then you're phasing it in over a period of time. So you can phase it in quickly or slowly, ramping it up. Um, and then in part because of some policy folks uh, who are early users of the beta model, I believe, um, got even more sophisticated in terms of final price, you're to start achieving final carbon price. So you can make it even more sophisticated. Instead of a start ramping, a straight ramping line, you say, all right, here's the initial price, here's the future price, and tweaking that, you can get actually quite sophisticated about that. Then there's emissions performance standard. Setting that, um, in, instead of cost per ton, there's a emission standard, like how many tons of CO2 per terajoule. Um, and then for the emissions performance standards start year, you can change that as well. So you can do those either in conjunction with or instead of the carbon price. So this gets uh, super detailed. Um, then you've got, of course, the, uh, the different relevant graphs over here. Um, you can, another really useful feature is you've got the information box where you're giving examples of what do we mean by carbon price? What's the big dynamic? What are the key dynamics that you see when you're talking about a carbon price? And then we didn't get into this much at all, but talking about co-benefits beyond just reducing GHG emissions, what are the important co-benefits of a specific measure? And what are the equity considerations? What are the things that you should be taking into account? Um, and Drew, Ellie, or Caroline, I don't know if you want to say anything more about what's underneath the hood in terms of carbon price. I think you nailed it. I think okay. you nailed it, Chris Page. So, and in terms of assumptions in general, I touched on this a bit. You can really, really geek out. Um, in a whole bunch of these different categories. Not only is this based on really, really good peer reviewed science uh, and a really robust model, but pretty much most assumptions, you can go in and change them to see whether it changes behavior over time, which is really useful when you're talking about somebody who has a very strong mental model about a specific leverage point or wants to ask a question about what if all sorts of different things. Pretty much most of them are covered um, and have, they haven't been covered yet. They're probably going to get covered in the next version. Um, so there's a lot under the hood here. You can stay on the surface and play with the different sliders or you can get really, really deep into individual categories. So unless there are other questions, or other comments from Roberta or Andrew. I think this is a wrap. What do you guys think? Yep, sounds right to me. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Really Thank appreciate it. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.